Okay, folks, today we are going to talk about intermolecular forces. This is the next to the last podcast. I'm going to try and do it as quickly as I can. Um, states of matter. When do substances become solids, liquids, and gases? For example, let me just look at the first couple. Butter will melt in your hand, which means it's a solid at room temperature, even if it is a soft solid, and it's a liquid at body temperature. Whereas look at water. Water is definitely a liquid at room temperature, and it's still a liquid when it's at body temperature. Why is that? Butter has, uh, water has already melted, because it melted at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So it melted at a much lower temperature than butter did. Why is that? And why is it that steel hasn't melted yet, and won't melt for a long time? Well, how do you account for the fact that some things like Oxygen, nitrogen, helium, neon, they're all gases at room temperature. Whereas some things like water and isopropyl alcohol and gasoline are liquids at room temperature. And some things like wood and steel and plastic are all solids at room temperature. Well, it has to do with the attractive forces between the molecules. Now, guys, I'm not talking about within a molecule. I'm talking between molecules. So let's look at what these prefixes mean. When you look at these first four up here, interstate highways, internet, intersection, and intercollegiate, if you think about them, they all have something in common, and they mean between. So an interstate highway are highways between two or more states. The internet connections between two or more computers. An intersection would be a crossroads, which means two or more roads crossing. An intercollegiate means between two or more colleges. Whereas the word intra means within. So an intranet is a network within a company. We have one at our school. Or we could have intramural, which means you have um, sports at college between uh, within a college. Yeah, they're between two dorms or something, or two whatevers, but they're still within a college. And intravenous means it's within a vein. Right? So you need to understand the difference between inter versus intra. So intermolecular means between two or more molecules. So this is something new because what we've been studying is the forces that are within. We've been studying intramolecular forces. So we have been studying what holds a molecule, a molecule together. So we've been studying what holds a one single molecule together, like ionic covalent, etc. Now we're going to discuss what holds two or three or four molecules together. So we have this cool little chart. We'll talk about the numbers later, but I want to show you some of the ones that you know. For example. If you have a compound that's ionically bonded within the compound, the sodium is bonded to the chlorine. Well, that's true. So you might have one sodium bonded with one chlorine, like right here, right? But that sodium is also attracted to other chlorines as well, and the chlorines are attracted to other sodiums, and the sodiums are attracted to other chlorines, and you come up with this crystal lattice work like we talked about in the previous podcast. We talked about the positive cations attracting the negative anions because they're oppositely charged, and you create a crystal, like you see salt crystals here. What about metallic bonds? Well, metallic bonds are things like gold. It's held together by metallic bonds. And you see all of the nuclei all sitting here, and then you see the sea of electrons. It's all just kind of floating around. The electrons can float wherever they want right, in this sea of electrons. And that holds the, uh, the, all of the molecules together. So we've talked about those before. We have not talked about network solids. And these are a subset of covalently bonded things. Kind of, sort of. And a network solid, I'll give you three examples, because there all, are only three. There are diamonds. So there's just pure carbon. And pure carbon, diamond is pure carbon. It's extremely, extremely hard. And we also have graphite over here which, again, is simply carbon. The difference is that if you take graphite and you put it under very high temperature and very high pressure, it will turn into a diamond. So these, this is the crystal, the, this is the lattice work, if you will, of a diamond, where in three dimensions, 
the tetrahedral shapes are all held together. Whereas with graphite, you're really working in two dimensions, and you have these sheets of, excuse me, sheets of graphite all attached to each other. And if you look up here, you can see, for example, how there's a shear wall where, the, uh, where this stuff has sheared off. It's because it is in sheets that it can come off. Now, there's one more network solid we need to talk about, and that's silicon dioxide. And silicon dioxide is simply sand, and it's very, very, very hard. We make glass out of it, and so it's another very, very hard substance that we use. Okay? And it also is in crystal form. Those are network solids, and those are the very hardest things that we can make on Earth. They hold together really, really hard. Okay. So now that leaves, under covalent, that leaves polar and nonpolar molecules. Well, you know what polar and nonpolar molecules are. We've talked about them in the past. So we're going to separate out polar molecules from nonpolar, and specifically we're going to talk about things that have dipole forces between them. So if we have something that is a polar molecule, meaning it has a slightly positive and slightly negative end. And you can go back and look at your, uh, your electronegativity table for this. But if we have bromine bonded to fluorine, this has 4 and this has 2.8 as your electronegativity. So the electrons spend more time with fluorine, fluorine leaving behind a slightly positive charge, and fluorine would have a slightly negative charge. The stronger the dipole is, the longer it remains a liquid or a solid, you have to heat it up more to separate it. But what happens is you're going to have Br and you're going to have F, and it's going to line up with another Br and F, or maybe another Br and F over here, so that the slightly negative charge can be close to a slightly positive charge. Right? And so they're going to line up in, in, uh, in a structure like that, so they're going to hold together pretty well. Okay, so this graphic kind of shows that, where you can see the big blue blob, if you will, which has given up its electron, and the smaller green blob that has taken an electron, and the electron spends more time with the green blob. Remember, these are shared, they are not taken. So one end has a slight positive charge, so we're going to say that one has a slight positive, and that one over here has a slight negative. The charges are fixed. So the molecules rotate so that the positive of one molecule is close to a negative of another one. The stronger the dipole, the higher the boiling point, the higher the melting point, because the molecules hold on to each other longer. Again, remember, these are forces between the molecules, dipole to dipole forces, are between two molecules that are polar. Remember, we talked about dipoles in our last podcast. All right. So we're going to come over here now, and we're going to look over on the left at hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is actually very simple. It's a subset of dipoles. It simply means that hydrogen is one of the elements, and it's bonded to either fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So that's where this comes from, right? is that hydrogen has to be bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So the yellow thing here is going to be hydrogen. And let's say this other one over here, it really doesn't matter what it is. Let's say it's fluorine. So the electrons spend most of their time over with fluorine, only a little bit of time with, their, with hydrogen. So hydrogen gets up with a slightly positive charge, fluorine slightly negative, and another one is going to line up near it that has a negative charge, and this part down here is going to have a slightly positive charge. Okay. So the rule for hydrogen bonds is they're just like a dipole, nothing exciting there, except one of the elements has to be hydrogen, and the other element has to be hydrogen, oxygen, or nitrogen. The electronegativity difference is substantial, so it simply is a dipole, but it's a stronger dipole than most dipoles. So it's going to tend to become a liquid and stay a liquid longer. Okay. Now if you look at, this is simply another diagram where the hydrogen and oxygens are lining up. The positive pieces are lining up with the negative pieces. Now I will warn you, and you've got to make sure you understand this, these are not bonds. They're attractive forces. We call them hydrogen bonds, but they're really not bonds. They're simply strong intellectual, intermolecular forces. So just be careful of that. Right? Bonds are within a molecule. So if I look at, if I look here, there are bonds within there. There 
are bonds within here. These are really not bonds. They're attractive forces. We call them bonds, so be careful with that. Right? These hydrogen bonds, these hydrogen attractive forces, cause the water to have a very high boiling point compared to what it should have based on the size of the molecule. All right, so all we have left are these strange ones down here called London dispersion forces. What in the world are London dispersion forces? Well, London dispersion forces are things like noble gases. Noble gases have very little attraction to each other. They can only become a liquid under very high pressure and very low temperature. These forces are created simply by the movement of electrons, and there has to be constant change in where the charges are. You can think helium, it has an s orbital. You can think of something like H2. So let's look at H2. This is a good example. Sorry, let's see if I can write. This thing is fighting me right now. All right, so it's hydrogen bonded to hydrogen. And as these things are rotating, let me get the pen out of the way, it's just confusing matters. As these things are rotating, notice how the electrons are moving. And when the electrons move, for an instant in time, they do create one end of this that's more positive than the other. And at that moment in time, one molecule will attract another one. So as the charges are changing and as they're moving, it creates a very, very, very small attractive force. And that's why things like H2 or O2 or N2, all of these are examples of that, um, are all gases at room temperature because they don't attract each other very much. All right, so dispersion forces depend completely on a temporary dipole. It's only there for a moment. And if you have something that in, in your solution that is a dipole, it can go and affect something else and cause it to become a dipole. So it's easier to induce a dipole in a larger molecule because the electron cloud is further, than, further from the nucleus so it's not held in as tightly, and so the electrons can move. So um, we're going to go over in our next podcast which ones are weakest, which ones are strongest, but that's something that you're going to need. So you might want to write this thing down before you go from here. All right. So which of these two is going to be stronger? Which of these two is going to hold together more? Well, CH4 has one carbon and four hydrogens. So this simply is, um, it, there is no dipole here. This is all just uh, London dispersion forces. And this is London dispersion forces. Which one's going to hold together more? Well, this is very small. This is much larger. And there's much more opportunity for the hydrogens that are, that are around these carbons to interact with other molecules. The bigger the molecule is, the more chance you have to have something polar going on in there, some positive piece that's going and connecting and getting near to something else. Okay, but since they are, uh, since all of these things are nonpolar, then what you're looking at is just a little bit of force. That that simple, um, where it's constantly changing, there's just a little bit of attractive force. So. CH4 to another CH4 doesn't attract each other much. Another CH4? Well, and frankly, C8H18 does not attract much to another C8H18. However, it does attract some because there are so many momentary dipoles going on with all the hydrogens on the outside of this that are going reacting with all the hydrogens on the outside of that. They have just little bits of, of interactions. And when you put all those little bits of interactions together, the molecules hold together better. So um, this one is going to have a higher boiling point than methane gas. And in fact, that's true because this is a gas at room temperature. And this is actually gasoline. It's octane. So it is a liquid at room temperature. All right. So you need to know the difference between inter and intermolecular forces. And you need to know that there are different forces that hold the molecules to other molecules. That's what we're looking for, for intermolecular forces. So that's it. Questions? Ask me in class. Do the worksheets. Hope you took notes. And you're almost done. See, see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I'll see you in class. Have a good one. Bye-bye.